Hey everyone, welcome to today's virtual event. I'm really excited to have this one. It's gonna be a really great conversation. The name of today's event is Designing a Resilient Food System for a Post-COVID World. And I'm your host, Michael Wolf. And I'm really excited to have two great guests from IDEO's Design for Food team. We have Holly Bybee, who is the Senior Director for Design for Food at IDEO, and Rebecca Chesney, the Senior Portfolio Lead for Design for Food and Sustainability. I think Circular Systems. Rebecca, did I get that right? Yeah, it's circular economy. <laughs> circular economy. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. <laughs> All those things. Well, this is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a really thought-provoking conversation. Um, you know, today's conversation is about the food system and the supply chains. And man, nothing really exposes cracks in the system like a crisis, like a pandemic. And so, uh, I thought it would be a great time to have a conversation with two people who think a lot about designing big systems and designing products and how we can rethink that a little bit um, and how we maybe take a pause and think about redesign, redesigning the food system. So um, today's structure for today's call is pretty typical to similar ones where we're going to basically have um, folks, uh, these two presenters present some ideas and give a little context. And that'll take about the first 20 minutes or so. Then I'll have some questions and, and some thoughts and, and think and we can have that little conversation and then we'll go to the audience. So I want everyone to start thinking of questions. So we've already seen one or two submitted. We also had a registration form uh, field where people ask some questions and I have some of those ready to go as well. But if you have a question, feel free to just hit that little ask a question button down at the bottom and also just throw them in the social sidebar. If they're good, I'll throw them into the question field and we'll just have those ready to go. So we already have some people saying hi. We have Rebecca uh, say, uh, so Alex from Italy saying hi, Rebecca. Um, we have Rob hey, Carroll <laughs> saying hi from Merseyside. So, hey, everyone. And of course, Jane, Jane Fryman, how are you doing? Um, so let's get going. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Holly. You're going you're yep. gonna to start, and we're going to make your slides kind of the big focus screen. And uh, Great. let's get going. OK, let's move on to the next slide. There we go. Hi, um, we're excited to be here today. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, Rebecca and I are here uh, representing a few of our closest friends that you see here. This is our colleagues at the Design for Food uh, portfolio at IDEO, and we're here representing a lot of the thinking and the work that we've all been doing. Um, we wanna share some things that we're seeing emerge as a result of COVID-19, which we think are providing compelling provocations for how design can play a role in uh, creating a more resilient food system. So we wanted to say in advance that we're not coming with really rigorous, deeply researched expert opinions or defined opportunity areas because there's just so much work to be done and this is happening so fast. But rather we're here with, um, with provocations that we want to use to spark conversation here and hopefully beyond uh, this, this webinar. And then also to hopefully um, spark new perspectives as well. And we also wanted to say that admittedly, many of our examples that we're using are very US centric, um, which therefore they're extreme in some ways and some of the topics that we're covering. We realize that there's a lot of similarities and differences between what's happening here in the US and other regions in the world. So we wanted to welcome you to please share links as we go in the chat that um, might be to examples of things that are happening in your region or country or um, things that you're working on that we could all um, benefit from and broaden our learnings. Okay. So many of you know IDEO. You probably know us for a lot of the things that we've designed like the Apple Mouse, the Bank of America Keep the Change program, um, maybe the Innova School System in Peru. And for being one of the organizations that pioneered human-centered design, um, you may have seen our shopping cart video at business school, as many have. Um, you, may, you may have taken a course or two through IDEO-U or participated in an open IDEO challenge. And actually, I know for sure that some of you have um, partnered with us on innovation efforts through your organization. And so over time, it's been 40 years, we started out as an industrial design firm um, but over the years, we've really redefined what design is and the value that it brings to society. And today, it's not just about creating a beautiful object that perfectly solves an unmet need or a desire. Um, it's become a tool. It's become a tool for change makers to use as part of many within their toolkit in order to collaboratively understand the many dimensions of the biggest challenges that we're faced with today. 
and to identify points of intervention and systems to create tangible solutions that can begin to shift that system. We're now applying um, this point of view on design and this approach to design in the areas of education and learning, in health, in designing organizations and uh, future state organizations, in technology, and many more. As one of those sectors, IDEO has been innovating in the space of food and beverage for about 15 years, so quite a while, and we've learned a lot. And one of the things that we've learned that in the past five years that have made us make different decisions about the challenges that we want to tackle and the organizations and, and people that we want to partner with on this journey aligned with this purpose, which is to design nourishing food futures for all beings and the planet. We believe that in order to create this future, uh, it's really important to tackle these challenges, to really take them on head on, to do it collaboratively, to do it in a way that we can take ideas and research and make those things tangible into new types of solutions, life-centered solutions. In that effort, we've had the privilege of partnering with um, literally some of the most amazing people. Um, organizations and teams at the World Wildlife Fund, we've been helping them in their extensive efforts to reduce food loss on farms. We've partnered recently with the Rockefeller Foundation and Second Muse on Future Vision 2050. This is a global open challenge, which is meant to empower communities around the world to envision and build towards a food future, which they aspire to. Um, not pictured here is the work that we're doing, um, that Rebecca is leading through our Circular Economy of Food collab. Through this effort, we partner with Danone, Electrolux, Kroger, and a multitude of other partners like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, with the purpose of activating ecosystems to take on the kinds of challenges that are really much too big for any one organization to tackle alone. And with closed loop partners, which you'll see in the lower right, and brands like Starbucks and McDonald's and Yum, we accelerate solutions that can make a massive impact in very specific shifts, um, but potentially massive systemic shifts like bringing fully recoverable hot and cold fiber cups um, to a global scale. The work we've done in the food and beverage industry uh, has really reinforced our belief that actually the food system isn't broken. It's doing actually very well for that matter, what it was designed to do. But it's not serving everyone. It's not serving the planet. And so to move to the inclusive, regenerative, nourishing system that we want to see, it's got to be redesigned. And it's amazing to think about the time that we're in, in terms of the opportunity to redesign the system. I mean, we're all living in this moment where change that typically would have taken maybe two years is happening in the course of two months or even a couple of days. Um, and it's really a time in which all the cards have been thrown up into the air, waiting to be gathered up into new patterns. And this is a quote from Heather Richardson, who's a professor of history at Boston College. And um, she has a newsletter where she kind of talks about what's happening in our present, um, really based off of looking at patterns um, in our past. And as a historian, you know, she truly believes that in order to understand the present, we need to understand how we got here. And in my training as a, a foresight practitioner for the food industry, it's the same process as you're looking towards the future, looking at patterns, understanding our past to better understand our present, but also so that we are better able to look at what possible futures are just on the horizon and how our actions in the present can help us shape those futures. And so what we wanna share with you today are a couple of provocations of how we might redesign the food system based off of what we've done in our work, what we're seeing currently because of the COVID crisis, and really through our design lens that we take on the food system. And um, we're only sharing kind of two areas of focus today. As Holly mentioned, a lot is changing, a lot is happening. Um, in particular, we can think about the role of diets, and how that connects with um, your ability to kind of have a strong immune system and overcome a, a virus such as COVID-19. Um, but today we're actually gonna be focusing a lot on um, the supply chain and the people working within it. 
And if we think about um, where we are today in our food system and how we got here, you know, the current food system was really designed um, and, and kind of optimized for efficiency, really thinking about um, that ratio of outputs to, in to inputs and maximizing that ratio. And so in this process of a few decades, what that has led to is designing out biodiversity and um, building machines that can rapidly harvest row upon row of, of a single crop. Um, we've consolidated um, to achieve economies of scale and kind of lowering costs. We've streamlined even seasonality, some of the most dynamic parts of nature. Um, we found ways to make that very, very efficient through controlled ripening facilities, through indoor agriculture. And I think in this moment, it's interesting to note that a lot of this focus on efficiency, um, one of the things that accelerated that actually was a global crisis. If we think about where the world was coming out of World War II, and a lot of our focus went to producing as much food as we could as cheaply as possible because people were hungry. Um, so just kind of thinking about how sometimes the constraints of a crisis can accelerate us on a path and then down the line, we learn that maybe it's no longer working for us. Um, and so the COVID crisis is really revealing that prioritizing efficiency in the food system can actually lead to rigidity. And what we're seeing right now is these images and stories of farmers um, dumping milk and smashing eggs, leaving crops unharvested as more and more people are experiencing food insecurity every day. And you know, our supply chain um, is really not set up to rapidly adapt, adjust, and respond at scale. But people across the food system are stepping in to ensure that people have food to eat. We've seen around the world restaurants quickly pivoting to repackage food that they would have been made into, me into meals to eat in the restaurants. We're seeing them turn those into meal kits or pantry items, kind of becoming hybrid grocery stores. And that's something that small independent restaurants are doing all the way up to chains. Um, chains such as Kishi, Tanaka in Tokyo or Panera Bread here in the US. We've also seen grocery stores um, recognizing that food is going to waste and realizing that they have the um, capacity and the capabilities to help mitigate and reduce that waste. And so here in the US, Kroger and Publix and a few other uh, grocery stores are buying milk and produce that would have gone to waste processing it in their facilities, and then donating to food banks. And then um, farmers are also thinking about how they can use what they have, which is land, to help address the crisis. And there's, there are some um, commodity farmers in the central part of the US who typically grow wheat and corn for the global market. And they're really rethinking how they might use cover crops to provide food for their communities. So instead of growing alfalfa, they're throwing out these mixes of seeds that include melons and squash and okra. And their plan is to invite their local communities to come harvest that food in the summer once it's ripe. So again, kind of rethinking, what are the outputs of my farm and how can I change those outputs in a moment of crisis and maybe after the crisis? So these are all really important, but temporary responses to a large set of problems. You know, underlying some of these challenges is um, this approach towards efficiency in, in recent decades. So we've seen this get big or get out policy approach really propped up large scale operations, which when everything is working, it might be quite efficiency, uh, efficient. But once something uh, breaks down, that actually creates major bottlenecks and it's leaving farmers with few options. I mean, there have been a lot of stories about food companies rapidly shifting their factories from producing beer to producing hand sanitizer. There's also stories um, of farmers changing their food processing and meat uh, processing plants into facilities to euthanize animals because our system is just not able to um, keep running at, at, at the capacity that it has before. We also have built a just-in-time infrastructure. So what that means is there's not enough slack in terms of storage capacity and logistical, logistical capacity, especially for fresh food, food that needs to be kept safe in order to be allowed to be circulated and sent to eaters. And then products intended for bulk buyers can't easily be repackaged for household or retail formats. So what we've done is we've created these very specialized 
supply chains with a certain end in mind. So it's 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 you know it's it's not a small thing to take something like a massive 50 pound bag of potatoes and turn that into 50 one pound bag of, of potatoes that could then go into a retail store. Um, that's a, a large investment in um, infrastructure in order to think about um, kind of rapidly adjusting our supply for different endpoints. And you know, even before the crisis, these problems were actually presenting themselves to us. We were, we were already seeing massive amounts of food waste, client, climate change impacts, and these were already indicating that this type of efficiency that we were pursuing really focused on yields, really focusing on reducing costs and saving people time and convenience. That's not really viable in the long term. And so we see with this collection of problems an opportunity for design to help create um, potentially a new path forward for the food system. So the first is designing for adaptability. And this is really about moving our supply chain infrastructure from a very kind of efficient but rigid approach to something that's much more dynamic and flexible and responsive to the environment. And what this might entail is um, embracing redundancy and complexity rather than designing it out. So instead of having one large meat processing facility for an entire region, what if we had many smaller players doing the same thing? A bit more redundancy than we currently have, but over the long term, that would make us more resilient. So it's really thinking about the food system in terms of a network as opposed, of kind of a, as opposed to a linear system where one player gets knocked out and you kind of break the whole chain. Um, a lot of my work at IDEO focuses on um, new circular economy models for the food system. And I've been thinking a lot about how designing for that future might help us um, kind of have a new set of design principles, a new set of um, kind of decision factors that go into the strategies for the food system going forward. So I think about things like um, efforts to upcycle ingredients, food that would have gone to waste, or better utilized byproducts in the industrial supply chain. And that requires different types of types of infrastructure. It requires secondary processing facilities to stabilize these ingredients before they go to waste. Um, I think about some of the work that's going into reusable packaging and building out reverse lo logistics systems. And a lot of what that takes is thinking about the supply chain differently, more as a network, as opposed to a linear supply chain where there's an end user. It also requires a lot of digitization so that we can track components as they are moving throughout the supply chain, identify where they are and recirculate them. And you know, a lot of our food system right now with all of our focus on efficiency is actually done, uh, the documentation in a lot of times is pen and paper still. So there's a lot of work to be done to digitize the food system so that we know where things are and we can more easily route them um, to where they need to be. And then how might we create a system that better balances efficiency and resilience? So, you know, we've really been thinking about efficiency in a lot of ways in limited sense, outputs such as yield and uh, in a limited number of inputs. And more and more people are starting to think about different Think about outputs in a different way. So instead of thinking about calories, what if we actually are thinking more about nutrients and ensuring that we're growing nutrients and ensuring that people have access to nutrients? Um, if we think about um, resource efficiency and natural resources and how we're using them as opposed to just yield. And I have to be honest, we've, we've struggled with the word efficiency and whether that um, you know, makes a lot of sense for the kind of food system that we want to build. So really thinking about how we can redefine um, that and, um, and kind of think differently about our food system and whether it's truly serving us and serving the environment. And what's underlying this design for adaptability is really thinking about the people and um, the trust that's been built into the food system. You know, I mentioned that even with all the focus on efficiency, it's amazing how much of the food system still is pen and paper. And I've also been really amazed in all of our work to see the ways in which trust building across the food system 
is still very much a high touch process. You know, we've talked to a lot of startup founders who have um, created uh, products using upcycled ingredients, and they're having to go out and basically build new supply chains, build those relationships. And even in some of the work that we've done with retailers and farmers, a lot of um, work that happens behind the scenes is many years of building up relationships, shaking hands with people, um, and having that partner that you can trust. But what we're seeing is in a moment of crisis, um, you might have a trusted buyer or a trusted vendor, but if the system around you isn't um, enabling you to really leverage those relationships, you might need to find a new buyer very quickly. Um, and so there's this kind of interesting dynamic and tension really around um, you know, high touch trust building and adaptability and resilience. And so one of the things we've been thinking a lot about IDEO uh, or at IDEO I've been thinking a lot about the contactless world. And I think within the food system in particular, trust was already something that we were really looking at what the future of trust looks like. And I think that will be even uh, more uh, uh, of, a, of an urgent um, challenge for us to tackle in a contactless world. And you'll see here this quote from Chef Dan Barber, you can't shake the hand of a farmer anymore because you'll get a virus. The short food chain has turned out not to be resilient. So even for all of the work that's happened in recent years around building up local food systems, building up um, relationships with farmers more directly in farmers markets, even that is kind of limited by the fact that we are kind of in this different time in which shaking hands, building trust just needs to look different. There's also this question around how might we appropriately apply technology to rapidly build and bolster trust, but not undermine it. So I mentioned, you know, there's, a lot of work to digitize the food system, to enable some of this adaptability, some of these new models. But how do you do that um, in a way that um, still kind of honors the trust of relationships that are already in the food system um, without raising more questions about my data and how it's being used and who has access to it and all of these questions that um, we've all been grappling with as we think about digitizing the food system, um, but really not losing sight of the role of trust in building resilience. And then finally, how might we design for human-centered networks rather than impersonal supply chains? And really thinking about the fact that our food supply chain is not just the food itself, the trucks, the, the storage facilities, the processing plants. It's about the people who are part of that whole process and really designing for their needs um, in order to ensure that we're building for trust at the same time as we're thinking about resilience. This plate of food, so fragrant and appetizing, also contains much suffering. Uh, my colleague Vivian surfaced this quote from spiritual leader, leader Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and be before we continue, we wanted to just um, take pause for a moment and ask you to imagine the last meal that you had. Maybe it was breakfast, could have been dinner, lunch, or a snack. We're gonna take a second to reflect on the journey of how it got to your plate. So think for a second, who prepared that food? How was it processed or packaged and who did that? Where did it come from? And how did the food get to you? If it was an animal, who cared for it? If it was a plant, who cultivated it and who picked it? For a moment, Put aside thought about the food itself or the mechanics of how it got to you, but think about the people who made it possible for you to have that food on your plate. Who are they? Where do they live? How do they live? With so much focus on the food itself and the people that we want to buy that food, innovation in the food industry often overlooks the most important stakeholder groups or one of the most important stakeholder groups that we need to consider when we're designing the future. And those are the people who ensure that the food gets from farm to table. Resiliency in the food system really depends on the resiliency of the livelihoods of the people who power it. 
in, when we've designed this system, we've really in many ways placed the greatest financial burden or at least some of the greatest financial burden um, for compensating those essential workers to those um, who are harvesting, raising and serving our food. Farmers, large and small, across the world are finding it increasingly difficult to make a living, let alone be able to provide one for the people who work for them. And the other thing that we've done is that we've driven the cost of essential work so low as a line item that it doesn't provide a living wage and basic safety net. So for example, in the US, the food system employs more than any other sector at roughly 14% of the US workforce, but these workers have the lowest median wages of the, any industry at under $12 an hour. One of six restaurant workers is living in poverty and about 40% of restaurant workers are just on the edge of living in poverty. And a global population of really low wage migrant workers powers our agricultural system. COVID-19 has made it clearer than ever or maybe revealed it to some for the first time that without these people, the food system really can't operate. So just some of the things that we've been seeing and hearing, and I'm sure that, that you all and the work that you do have been seeing and hearing these as well, but we think that they're really important to highlight, which is that for one, grocery workers have been given essential status. Um, they're literally putting their lives at risk to feed housebound people like us. Um, from a recent Washington Post article, one of the grocery workers said about their job, it's like being in a war zone. And this wasn't a risk that they knew and signed up for when they took their jobs. But it's also not lost at this point that without them taking that risk, we literally wouldn't have food on our tables. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about the outbreaks in the packing facilities, the meat packing facilities in the US. And that's caused many of them to close, resulting in widespread euthanasia of animals, as Rebecca mentioned and how that's impacting the farmers who are raising those animals. Um, a quote from a New York Times article from a farmer said, this will drive people out of farming and that there will be suicides in rural America. And then the other thing that's really standing out is that even as we think about protecting people, essential workers from COVID-19 and other viruses and other things that will emerge over time, in this increasingly sort of um, changing world, um, adapting climate, uh, is that for protections for people harvesting crops, as an example, or even in meatpacking, they're really inconsistent, they're unenforceable, and they're largely not feasible for the farm. So it's just not possible for farm workers to socially distance, for instance, as they're trying to do their job in the most efficient and quick possible way, or the fastest possible way. Um, or to wear masks in the blistering sun for four hours as they do that work. And farmers can't afford the PPE necessary to protect their workers. This represents a really enormous burden for our industry, but we also feel like this is an incredible opportunity for innovation. Um, and that more than ever, we really have to ensure that these essential workers are seen, heard, and most importantly, included in the design of our future. As these issues have been emerging, response has actually been really swift. You know, we have seen, as Rebecca mentioned, some of these new innovations and these changes occurring literally overnight that it really would have taken so many months and ironclad will to make happen in past circumstances. Um, in the restaurant industry, we're seeing the Band-Aid of GoFundMe campaign set up to uh, compensate for lost wages for people who work in that industry. And that also a lot of restaurants are thinking about how they can find other types of work for um, their servers and for their kitchen staff. So in, in some ways, um, uh, some places they're becoming delivery drivers in order to keep the restaurant alive and to maintain their jobs. Another really interesting development that we're really excited about, and shout out to Sodexo, um, for partnering with Kroger, PepsiCo and Amazon in order to create and find 300,000 job opportunities for their employees. And what's really interesting about that is that these employees have already been vetted by Sodexo, they're trusted, they're trained, they understand food safety. And so it's really easy, it's much easier for Kroger, for instance, to be able to bring on those employees into that environment with having the, without having to um, go through all the training of bringing in people who haven't been involved in the, in the food industry. And then finally, there's the interventions that are happening from governments across the world. So 
In Portugal, for instance, they are extending temporary residency um, uh, to some of the migrant workers so that they can have health care. We've seen the states, not so much the federal government, um, but we've seen um, some help from the federal government in the US, but in California, um, Gov Governor Newsom quickly mandated supplemental paid sick leave for, for food sector workers. And in that, he noted that food sector workers are really on the front lines of the pandemic and they're essential critical infrastructure workers. It's really, it's interesting that the essential nature of these workers has not changed. They've always been essential. It's just through COVID-19, we're really um, realizing much more about the fragility of the system that we've designed to support them. So as we think about the opportunity for design and the potential and the need for innovation in this space, many of our provocations are around how we might take a more evenly distributed responsibility for food system workers. So first we have an opportunity to design for dignity. We need to systematically and permanently elevate the status of food system workers to essential. Um, we need to design new and better ways to distribute the economic responsibility for their livelihoods to ensure the sustainability in times of tumult. And we need to include worker voices in the stories we tell about our food. So one of the things that we think about first is how do we share that responsibility and accountability for their livelihoods, for their health and the safety of workers? Imagine for instance, if some of the largest and most profitable players in the food system took responsibility for the livelihoods of workers in the most vulnerable positions in a way that would ensure their security and provide safety nets in times of need. We also think about how do we design with and not for worker communities towards better lives. So how do we include their voices as well in our innovation efforts and use them as inspiration as we think about the future of things like the grocery store, thinking about ag tech and innovation and farming, and as we think about the future of the restaurant industry during and post COVID. And finally, how might we ensure that those touching our food are themselves food secure, because many of them are not. So imagine a world where it was actually guaranteed that food system workers were able to sit down every night to a warm meal, that they had time to prepare themselves and have access to healthy food abundant enough to sustain their family. The second is that we need to design for agency People need sustainable ways to pursue livelihoods that can withstand increasingly rapidly changing conditions such as unevenly distributed or shifting job opportunities. And one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is the impact of innovations in automation, which are likely going to be, and, and rightly going to be accelerated as we think about um, the need for new safer uh, environments. So, one of the things we think about is how do we create new pathways for individuals to access work when innovations and imbalances displace, displace employment? And we think that the sodexo kroger relationship is a really um, great example of um, the promise of this possibility. And, and how could we start to imagine a world where this model was designed to be more pervasive and systemic? As automation begins to advance and innovation in that space and funding for that um, innovation accelerates, how, how can we provide new opportunities for otherwise displaced workers? How do we actually design that thinking into the process of innovation? So how do we not abandon the people who actually have been in the industry for a long time? They understand the nuances of the operations. They've been with these companies for many years. How do we provide them opportunities for growth in this uh, transition. And then finally, uh, how do we actually think about the food industry, help, helping the food industry build actually a culture of continuous learning as a tool for resilience? So imagine a world where more people, it does happen, but imagine a world where more people could start their career in some of the most vulnerable frontline positions and be provided through their work and through their employment, through the industry, to access to the tools and the support to enable them to occupy some of the most senior positions across the industry.
So these are really different design principles that we are bringing into our work and that we hope that you as food industry leaders and people who are making decisions every day um, and you know, in this moment of crisis where the future does seem so uncertain, but also you know, bringing in a longer term view of the, the choices and the actions that we take in the coming months and the path that that will set us on um, potentially for the food system going forward. So thinking about adaptability, trust, dignity, and agency as lenses through which you can um, kind of think through those decisions strategically and in a kind of human-centered and systems-centered way. And that's what we're doing in our work, and uh, we'd love to hear more about the work that you're doing and where you're seeing these design principles show up um, because of the coronavirus crisis and beyond. So I think with that, we will open it up to questions and um, um, some examples from all of you in the audience. So I think, Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Um, just a sec here. Oh. Um, shoot. Oh. Hey there, guys. Sorry about that. I was having trouble with my. <laughs> you can Hello. hear me. Wow, sometimes uh, you're having a little bit of trouble. Well, that was awesome. Thank you guys for doing that. That was really insightful. Um, I just want to say um, it put me in mind, Rebecca, as you were talking about this idea of how everything was built for efficiency and speed. It put me in mind of a race car, right? Or a Le Mans car that works really well on, on a track. Um, but then once you get it off track, off terrain, it breaks down almost immediately. So um, are we, as we think about designing these new food systems, do we need to think about it in, in that sense where we may sacrifice speed and almost make things more all terrain and the ability to kind of handle more shocks of the system? Yeah, exactly. I think that's why I think, you know, the, the question that I posed around embracing redundancy and complexity, um, you know, it's interesting because we all know the food system is incredibly complex and we talk about that, but it's almost like, in, you know, instead of figuring out how to work within that complexity, and nature is very complex, um, we kind of think about, well, how can we control it? Or how can we streamline it? How can we reduce it? And what we're finding is that um, that doesn't always work because we've designed a system for certain conditions. Um, but when those certain conditions at the scale that we're seeing, a global scale disruption, then it's really hard to adapt. I really like that idea or that metaphor of the racetrack being on one track versus an all-terrain vehicle. <laughs> it's fun to go off-road too, right? right. So if you, if it's just fun to drive a... fast. It's exactly. also fun to go off-roading. So. <laughs> so we have to exactly. sacrifice speed to a certain degree to kind of have, have the ability to handle things uh, more. You also yeah. talked about this idea, um, which I liked as an old network analyst, um, about where you basically need to think of things more less linearly if we're thinking about supply chains, talking about supply chains and more like a network. And if you think about the way they designed the original internet and the way they still design in the, the internet is it has that redundancy built in. So you don't have these single points of failure and there's single points of failure all over the food system. We, you know, you, I think you mentioned meat processing, you know, there's what 12 meat processing plants in the U S um, one has a thousand COVID cases. So it's essentially bringing that, processing plants to its knees. So as we think about designing more robust supply chains, I would imagine we need to decentralize power a little bit and decentralize a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And I think that principle, it it just also makes me think about the fact that we get so much of our food from, you know, 12 crops. You know, it's it's we've lost diversity in a lot of different respects in the food system. What it, I think what's interesting is that um, a lot of the innovations that we get excited about, uh, you know, thinking about new production methods like indoor growing or something like cultured meat or upcycled food products, you know, innovation is kind of happening at the edges of the food system. But what happens is as we kind of figure out how to scale it and bring it and it, it gets kind of caught up in this whole sort of centralized top down approach of the food system at the same time. So I think balancing much more um, towards diversity, including diversity in approaches, the diversity in ideas, 
um, and thinking more about the interconnectedness of different pieces of the food system um, over time will allow for a lot more resiliency. So really thinking about the food system as a network and understanding where do I sit within that network if I'm in a food company or if I'm a farmer, you know, who are my close in partners, but beyond those close in partners, who are they connected with? And, and just kind of thinking about making that as robust as possible. Mm -hmm. I think, I think in many ways we have to begin to rethink this whole idea of food at scale. As we think about these changes in a networked approach, our notion of food at scale that's dominated by a few large companies that drive towards greater and greater and greater efficiency in order to stay alive. I mean, that model was breaking down before COVID-19. We just haven't been able to quickly enough to Rebecca's point, bring in the innovation that's happening around the edges and give it enough funding, give it enough support in order for those new alternatives to grow and become something that are big enough to adapt the, um, the existing infrastructure. Yeah, and I want to go to a question. I mean, uh, there's already some great questions in there. And the reason I want to go to this one is because it kind of speaks to what you're just talking about, Holly, where there's this aggregation of power to a certain degree. And so Elliot Smith, asks, you know, how is IDEO thinking about the role of ownership in the work of remaking our food economies? In addition to being just temporary, aren't efforts led by large corporate groups, especially like Amazon, groups like Amazon, risking some of the same core flaws that got us to this breakdown? So market power aggregation is always going to have this tension. We're seeing it now during the recovery efforts. How do we deal with that? <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> um, I think that we're seeing also a lot of some of those big entities are actually starting to make um, big commitments to change. Danone being a great example of that. I think Kroger is increasingly becoming a good example of that. But, um, and, and I would say even need to be made in order to disaggregate that power. But I think what we haven't really figured out yet is what does that mean for quarter over quarter growth and the demand of being a public company and having shareholders? Because ultimately, that need has been what has um, fueled the, I don't know, I guess the hunger or the drive of these big corporations. Because without that growth, then they risk not being in existence and you know, CEOs are not you know, living up to their fiduciary responsibility, et cetera. So I think that's a massive problem. I think companies like Mars, for instance, private companies are much better positioned to be able to get a lot of traction and make the change that we need to see in, in the food system. But how do we decouple growth from, um, or like quarter over quarter growth from uh, development in the food so system? So it's partly, we have to think about the way the system is built in terms of incentivization designs and rewards to a certain degree. Because when you look at the quarter quarter reporting, you look at Wall Street and fiduciary responsibility of a CEO of a publicly held company, like they're just trying to get that next quarter's growth higher. They're using money from, from, from the government, maybe for stock buybacks, all because they're incentivized the wrong way in large, in yeah. large to our degree. Yeah. And I would also add um, the role that the public sector plays in regulation. Because um, one of the things that we've seen with this concentration of power, you know, I had the quote, get in or, or get out, get bigger, get out, which was, you know, what the Secretary of Agriculture was saying in the US a few decades ago. And so things have been, there are regulatory barriers to a smaller, uh, you know, meat processing facility, for instance, being able to open or for a small um, farmer to be able to access um, facilities outside of the, the large um, quantities that are required for those more centralized um, facilities. And so there's, you know, as much as there's been interest in kind of developing software for agriculture and the supply chain, there's a huge need to invest in the physical infrastructure. So more, uh, you know, processing facilities that are closer to farms that can operate on a smaller scale, um, processing facilities that can be a little bit more nimble and can adapt to, um, you know, what what the current state of the market is, whether that's a bunch of food that's about to go to waste, whether that's, um, you know, uh, more freeze drying and, and or whether that's canning on site kind of closer. You know, there's just so many different ways to think about it. But um, we've been kind of focused so much on consolidation um, that 
you know, I always think about how people say that consumers are kind of removed from where their food comes from. And, but even farther up in the supply chain at, at like the processing level, we've also in a lot of ways um, separated that from where the farms are themselves because of consolidation. So there's definitely a role for policy to play and, and also thinking about the role of capital. Mm -hmm. So if this kind of investment needs to be made, um, who's going to do that? Is it a large food company or is it, you know, a smaller farmer? Uh, you know, is there a, a program through which, um, you know, you know, kind of collecting capital and kind of more like a co-op model where processing can be kind of shared amongst farmers? There's just so much. There's like this big gap between the, yeah. the startup or the smaller farmer and the specialty food producer and the Mars and the Deno, there's just this huge gap in between. I think, uh, I was gonna say also, it's yeah. um, the ability for philanthropic in dollar to be able to um, sustain with an effort, you know, systems change takes decades. It's not something that can be turned around overnight. And when you think about philanthropic investment, a lot of it is designed around um, getting a solution or creating one solution it's not set up in terms of its tenacity and its commitment over time to be able to focus on the change of a system itself. So to say, we're gonna commit you know, multi-million dollars over many years to the multitude of efforts that it's gonna require in order to make this change. I think um, as, as you know, philanthropic organizations begin to rethink their model, it will be a huge help for the system to be able to make that, get that kind of traction that it needs. Yeah. You talked and, about, oh, go ahead, Rebecca. I was just say one example that I would recommend um, people look into, and Holly mentioned the Food Systems 2050 um, effort that IDEO did with Rockefeller. And it was through um, our platform that people from around the world can submit ideas. And it was the most engagement of any open innovation challenge that IDEO has ever done. I mean, there's clearly so much appetite for people who currently aren't necessarily in, in, you know, working in a big food company, maybe they're a farmer, maybe they work in government, um, they have visions for what they want their future to look like and they need help activating those. But there's, I, it's just amazing to see how much appetite there is for people to um, share their visions and have those activated. You mentioned trust and that seems to be a theme you were focusing on. Um, you know, it's it's funny as I think about when I go out into the world now wearing masks, I just have trouble deciphering social signals, right? Like <laughs> is someone smiling at me? Are they glower? Are they are they looking at me angrily? It's hard to tell. Um, you talked about the, the handshake going away. Um, this, some of this may be fairly permanent change where we're gonna have to rethink social signals. Like, is that a big component as we think about redesigning the food system, like how we relate to one another and, and rethinking that to a certain degree? Yeah, I think um, you know, it's something I totally agree with you, Mike. I mean, living in a city, it's been weird. Normally you would walk by someone on a sidewalk and you kind of smile and now you find yourself going around them. It just, you know, like really keeping your distance. It's, 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 you know, I'm still not used to some of those things. Um, you know, I think that's a really big piece that, um, it will be interesting to figure, to, to kind of see how people creatively deal with this challenge. Because already, um, you know, there's a lot of work looking at the role of blockchain and other technologies to provide a lot of traceability and transparency. So we were already in some ways kind of looking at how technology could be a proxy for trust or at least kind of augment or give us a lens, a view into pieces of the food system that currently are completely opaque and not transparent to us. So, you know, I think seeing some of those things um, continue um, through this crisis will be important. And, and um, but for me, that question of, um, you know, what are going to be those cues? What are gonna be those rituals for building trust? Cause I, I've been really amazed by even very large scale companies, um, you know, talking to someone who works at a really large food company saying, you know, there's still this kind of expectation that you go to the farm at some point and you meet the farmer and you build that relationship, you shake the hand. There's just so much of that embedded in the, in the food system. Um, and that to me is a really great creative kind of immediate challenge is how do you 
what does that look like going forward? Um, and how much of the, you know, at, at some point, hopefully we will be able to shake hands again, but, um, you know, I, I'm just not sure what some of those things are, but it's a really big opportunity. Yeah. Is it building on that? It was really interesting talking to one of our close collaborators who was saying that in this world, and this is a person who's incredibly active in affecting change and so dedicated to it in the food system. And he was saying that one of the things that has been making his impact more difficult is um, in this world of COVID is the lack of serendipity. You know, mm -hmm. that in, in the trust building process that you know so-and-so and you know them and this, whoa, we've got to do something. That feeling of like, this is just right. This is something special that we have to move on. And so we've been talking about and thinking about how do we create those moments how do we create those opportunities for serendipity to uh, happen for trusted relationships to get even deeper? Um, and I know that that's something that organizations like The Spoon and Green Biz are, are working on, um, but that's gonna be really important for how we proceed. Yeah, just the the meetings and the hallways, the people you bump yeah. into. I'm just thinking the last major trip I took was in New York City at a WeWork and bumped into the founder I'd written about in the past. and. You just have these meetings, so it's so important. Um, there's an interesting comment by uh, a question by Axel Russo that I think kind of feeds into some of the, the change we've been talking about. So I want to ask this his question. He says, what is your vision of a possible transition between the two systems? In Europe, for example, massive intensive wheat production had been subsidized since the end of World War II, and farmers became totally dependent on it, from earnings to land and other capital. How can they benefit and become actors and not victims of change? I think that's a really interesting question. You know, we have a massive knee jerk in a way reaction necessary in a way to keep the economy alive through, you know, uh, you know, bailout money, et cetera. But it's hardening in a way it starts to harden post COVID structures to a certain degree. Right. So mm -hmm. like, how do we not harden systems so much that they're not as malleable as we need them to be as we think about redesigning them? If that makes sense. Well, yeah, well, that's where, um, you know, Holly asked the question, how do we design with and not for? Um, I think that's one key thing. Your art, I mean, if I think about, um, you know, in recent years, for instance, the stories of uh, groups like Farm Hack, where, where farmers are coming together, sharing their designs for um, farm equipment, open sourcing that to their community because of what's happening with companies like John Deere as tractors and equipment becomes much more um, you know, automated. They basically have very sophisticated computers on board. And what, hap what happens when digital rights management becomes part of your, uh, you know, what you need to manage as a farmer? So you can no longer um, do maintenance on your tractor that you typically would without violating your agreement. Um, so there's, there's there's already kind of stories where people are kind of pushing back <laughs> against that type of innovation. Um, and so thinking about how do you connect people to each other and how do you kind of get people's visions for what they want their future to be and have them involved in that process. Because I think, um, actually I was reading an article by a food historian about wet markets, um, which are of course are very popular right now because people rethinking wet markets and um, and in their connection to something like a pandemic. And I loved the way he framed, you know, regulation is relational. If it's top down, you alienate people and that kind of makes it harder to enforce. But if it's more bottom up and you involve people in the process, then that actually makes it more resilient over time because people had been have been kind of involved in the process and they've been able to shape the regulation that will then impact their work. And I think it's similar for so many things. It's similar for innovation, um, not just regulation. So kind of thinking about involving people who will be impacted in that process. Because they know what their needs are. They know what the gaps are. Yeah. There's a great there's a great conversation going on in the social sidebar. A uh, good comment from Aaron McCluskey. He says, moving from the concept of growing to thriving economies. I like that. Um, and there's more up. up. I've been enjoying reading it. Um, Anand, I think from... Uh, Stanford, so that's when I know from the, your collab, I think you partnered with them. Um, I think that's the, right, the same one on. He, he's asking about um, fresh and nutritious foods. And his question is, if we move our systems focus away from efficiency, 
won't costs increase and then therefore make fresh and nutritious foods even less accessible? So how do we not sacrifice the good things in the food system, I guess, as we redesign to some degree? I, I mean, I guess that's assuming that efficiency is leading to the lowest cost possible for the best type of food, because it's really not. It's not leading to access to healthy food for anybody, um, except mm -hmm. aside from those who have money. Um, it's, it's enabling access to some type of nutrition um, but not to healthy foods at the moment as it is. So I think that maybe it's a matter of reframing the question and reframing our thinking about the value of efficiency in making nutritious food accessible to people and affordable. Let's get a couple more questions in because I want to be mindful of people's times. Uh, Shauna Day um ask what role do you think the incumbents in the food system adm cargo gbs should play in this transformation i think you guys touched on a little bit but any thoughts on that yeah well one example that um and full disclosure we work with denim um but i think one of the ways i think the reason why we work with them they're, they're part of our circular economy collab which is a, a collaborative network of organizations that looks at um, how do we actually build a more regenerative future? Um, I think the reason why they are part of that program is because there is this commitment to thinking about the food system differently. But in a, in a quest to become a B Corp, um, they just, I think it was last week, filed um, with the French government um, their paperwork to hold themselves accountable to not just financial targets, but social and environmental targets and setting up an independent body that will hold them accountable. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's interesting the, the influence that these larger companies have, the relationships they have, the assets, the, the, um, the infrastructure that they have. I think those can all be leveraged in really interesting and powerful ways. Um, but that's where you know, really thinking about what's the role of an organization beyond, um, you know, earning money. Um, who are the stakeholders for that organization? People who work with within the organization, the farmers um, that that they source from. You know, all those questions. I think bringing in a much more kind of nuanced view of um, what it means to actually be in an effective organization in the 21st century. And I think just like our food system was designed for efficiency, a lot of our models for um, corporate governance and the role of companies in society are also quite outdated uh, as well. And, and I think that all of these companies, they're all involved in the conversation in some way, shape or form. They're all going to the conferences, they're going to the events, they're um, engaged in conversation online one of the biggest things that these organizations need to do is to move the focus of the effort and the funding um, m beyond just corporate social responsibility or beyond just the sustainability team because that's where they are going to be able to truly get involved like bringing as rebecca was saying their assets and partnering with some of the more um, progressive organizations that are moving much faster to enable them to not just be a part of the conversation, but to be a part of the, the business opportunities that are going to emerge as this transition will inevitably happen. So bring more funding to these efforts, bring it into your business, bring it into your core businesses and enable those teams to be thinking about how they can play an active role in this transition on behalf of their organizations. Yeah, I'll say nothing gets the IDEO team more excited than seeing a company that has brought its sustainability team and its innovation team together. That to us is, it's, it's so exciting to see when that happens because um, we really see that thinking about sustainability, regenerative food systems, circular food systems, that can actually drive innovation. Um, it's, it's not just about um, social responsibility, but it can be a driver for new business models, new revenue streams, like, utilizing streams of waste into different products, you know, thinking about services over ownership models. And so there's a lot of innovation to be had um, that will benefit the organization, we believe, as well as benefiting the environment and society. Yeah, in the old, you know, circa three years ago, in the old world, um, <laughs> a lot of the efforts around innovation and sustainability were, were 
were outposts, right? Like they, they might set up a, a large food company might set up an outpost in Silicon Valley, or they might set up a sustainability effort, but they're oftentimes almost like what we'd call uh, skunk works projects, uh, you know, where they weren't necessarily core. Um, and so this brings me to a question that is actually uh, in submitted during the registration. Someone asked, how might we put regenerative and sustainable practices at the heart of this redesign? I think you're kind of getting at it, but any additional thoughts there to make this stuff core to what we're doing? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's really the the driver of the work that we're doing um, at IDEO. Um, I, I think it looks like probably a lot of different things that need to happen <laughs> in order to make regenerative the core. Um, I mean, one of the things that I like to look for, um, again, kind of, I think this is from my training in foresight is to look for thing for solutions where people are kind of solving for multiple things. So not just trying to um, solve for hunger, but also thinking about a way to do that in connection with something like soil health. So as an example, why are more farmers not doing what those US farmers are doing where they're planting cover crops, but the cover crops are also edible. Um, so they're providing food for their communities or like a lot of the lentil farmers in the, the Midwest and the US, they realize by using lentils as a cover crop, not only are they um, improving their soil, but they're creating a whole new crop that they can then sell and, and earn revenue from. So I, I look, I, I think a lot about how, um, how can we kind of hit multiple issues because these are all interconnected problems as opposed to solving for one thing, which in such a system as the food system, at the end of the day, solving for one thing is likely to be more of a band-aid than anything else. Um, as opposed to really looking at improving the system overall. Yeah, and, and I think that it's critical that more C-level people understand what uh, regener regenerative systems mean and how that can um, benefit their business and how they play a role in the world. Because very few C-levels are involved in the conversation, are leading the conversation and with that type of engagement, I believe that we can get a lot more traction to getting it at the core of the business versus just things that are kind of happening around the periphery. Yeah, it's definitely a longer term view. So that's going to require, especially from the highest leaders, a commitment to this is a longer term view. Um, yeah, definitely. And the capital that will be required in order to make a transformation <laughs> <laughs> to get to that outcome. Well, this has been great. We're a little bit past the hour. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I would uh, uh, recommend that everyone in the social sidebar just give Holly and Rebecca a big thanks. Holly and Rebecca, if you have a way for people to get a hold of you or maybe a website, you can feel free to type that into the, to the comments on the sidebar. And people who yeah. want to just join There's us. There's also, um, I don't know if I don't know if you can see it, but I've also just shared, I don't know if you can see that. my screen, but we've got our emails here as well. If you want to do a screen grab of this, you're welcome to reach out to us as well. Yep. So we made that big. If people want to do a okay. screen grab, they could pause it yep. and get that. So Great. well, again, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank both of you for spending time with me. This has been really thought provoking mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, people can see why IDEO is seen as uh, really maybe the premier uh, design agency in in the world. You guys just do great work. So thank you for spending time with me. Thank you. Thank you so for much. having us. This was so great. And thanks everyone for your engagement. Thank you. Bye everyone. So thank yeah, you. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.